Hello, my name is Sandro Guerra, and I'm making this video to talk about something I call the mirror model. So, what is the mirror model? The mirror model is a simple but bold idea about developmental biology. It is a model that synthesizes the incredible complexity of life onto an elemental equivalence principle, or what I call a mirror effect. And you may wonder, how is it possible to explain life with a simple model? Life seems to be everything but simple. The answer to this question is not too complicated. It is a matter of putting things in the right perspective. Very often in science, we are concerned with very tiny little things. Things like gene expression, molecular pathways, or homeotic boxes. All these things are indeed very relevant, but I believe sometimes we lose sight of the big picture. If we really want to understand this puzzle we call life, we have to take a step back. We have to take a look from the outside first, and then see how things are related as a whole. And that is precisely what we're going to do on this video. We're going to take a step back, we're going to look at things from the outside, and then we're going to see how everything relates to the details. The mirror model can be pictured as something similar to an equation. An equation is a statement with two parts. And even though these two parts may look completely different at first glance, they are just two expressions of the same principle. I believe something very similar could be happening in complex life forms. So if the body, like an equation, consists of two expressions of the same principle, what could be these two fundamental parts? Based on the observations, the research, and the evidence I have found, I have come to the conclusion that these two parts are no other than the head and the rest of the body. Therefore, all the structures inside the head are iterated in the body. At first, this idea doesn't make much sense, and you may think this guy is probably delusional or he's high as a kite. The head doesn't look at all like the rest of the body. Furthermore, the brain is made out of nervous tissue, and the organs on the body are made out of a completely different set of tissues that have nothing to do with the brain. They don't even have the same origin. This idea also seem to contradict Ed Lewis' model of development by segments, which is the leading view of development today. I am of course aware of these apparent contradictions, but let's tackle them one at a time. First, how can I justify this tissue discrepancy? How can I get away with murder? To better understand what's going on, we have to take a look at the pre-embryonic process. We developed from a sandwich of three germinal tissues called the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. From the ectoderm, we get the skin, and we also get a tube that later turns into the nervous system, including, of course, the brain. From the mesoderm, we get the circulatory system, the muscles, the skeletal system, and structures like the heart, the kidneys, and the reproductive organs. From the endoderm, we get the guts, the lungs, the liver, the stomach, and the intestines. If this proposition is correct, then the part of the ectoderm that creates the brain will be following the same structures as the endoderm when it forms the guts, creating what I call a mirror effect. On the other hand, I believe the structures derived from the mesoderm also follow this mirror effect. But since they all have the same cytological origin, they don't show this tissue discrepancy. To better illustrate this idea, I have developed two catalogs of mirror structures, one of the skeletal system and another one of the organs on the body and the respective counterparts on the head. As I lay out these analogies, I will be discussing the reasons and the evidence that led me to these conclusions. Possible methods to test this hypothesis will be presented after the catalogs are laid out. The skull doesn't look much like the rest of the skeleton, but there is a hint that gives everything away. Ever since I was a kid, I have wondered, why is it that skeletons seem to have eye sockets on the pelvic bone? Now I believe that the pelvic bone seems to have eye sockets because they are indeed eye sockets. But now we have a problem. If the obturator foramina are the contraparts of the orbits of the skull, then we should have a frontal bone covering the abdomen. Fortunately, this is not the case, because it would be very uncomfortable to walk around with the frontal bone on the belly. But this helps me make a point. I don't believe all these alleged mirror structures are iterated on a one-to-one -one relation. Many of them could be partially expressed, they could be merged, or not expressed at all. Otherwise, an animal like a snake wouldn't fit into this model. This is precisely the case of the frontal bone. For many years, scientists and doctors have wondered why is it that we have so much bone marrow on the ribs and the crest of the alien. If this proposition is correct, this will no longer be a mystery. 
because all the marrow on these areas will be there to form a frontal bone that is never expressed. I believe the white tissue covering the abdomen called the rectus sheet is also accountable as an expression of the frontal bone. Following this order, the ribs will be a contrapart of the parietal bones, the sternum and the manubrium will be a contrapart of the occipital bone, the temporal bones will be the ilium, the sphenoid will be a merge of several structures like the vertebral column and the sacrum bone, the superior extremities would be the maxilla, the inferior extremities would be the mandible, the pterygoid plates would be a contrapart of the scapula, and the hyoid bone would probably be a contrapart of the clavicle. Even though the teeth are structures that develop from the ectoderm, I thought it would be a good idea to include them on this catalog, and I believe the most obvious contrapart of the teeth are no other than the nails. This is an artistic rendition of the skeleton arranged like the skull, according to the mirror model. You may probably think this is all very sketchy, but if this mirror model is correct, there should be a genetic footprint of these analogies. So I have looked for syndrome symptoms and functions that support these symmetries. Tooth and nail syndrome is a genetic condition associated with the ill formation of the teeth and the nails, which as you may remember, are parallel structures on this model. But one of the most important pieces of evidence on behalf of this idea, it's found hiding on plain sight. And I'm referring to the classic sample of the Antenopedia mutation, which was the key to prove Ed Lewis' model of segmentation. Antenopedia is a mutation on the fruit fly that basically replaces the maxillar with legs. Rings the bell? I'm starting to see a pattern here, but maybe it is just good luck. So let's see how lucky we get when we look at the next catalog. Let's look now at the organs in the body and their respective counterparts in the head. The first organ we have if we go top to bottom on the torso are the lungs, and I believe the contrapart of the lungs is no other than the cerebellum. If we look at the structure of the lungs, we'll see that the bronchus branch out in a fractal manner. Likewise, the cerebellum has a structure called the arbor vitae that also branch out in a similar way. This fractal distribution is a distinctive trait of these two parts of the body. Now the lungs are concerned with respiration. Respiration is not controlled by the cerebellum, it is controlled by the hypothalamus in an area nearby the cerebellum. However, it has been found not too long ago that deep nuclei within the cerebellum is responsible for respiratory modulation. The cerebellum is concerned with coordination, but if you ask any accomplished musician, dancer or athlete, they would tell you respiration is crucial to achieve coordination. Furthermore, a study conducted at the University of Zurich by Dr. P. Bernasconi and Dr. J. Koch showed that the degree of coordination during running exercises can be increased significantly by pace breathing. So there is not only a physical resemblance between the cerebellum and the lungs, there is also a functional connection, and I think this is important to highlight. Right between the lungs we find the heart. At first, the counterpart of the heart is not so easy to identify, but the heart has a peculiarity. Unlike most of the organs in the body, the heart doesn't develop from the endoderm, it develops instead from the mesoderm. For this reason, it is logical to infer that the contrapart of the heart also has a mesodermal origin. After looking at several structures of mesodermal origin within the head, I have come to the conclusion that the contrapart of the heart is no other than the eyes. But not only the eyes, I believe the pineal gland is also a fundamental part of something I call the ocular pineal complex. It has been found that most lizards, frogs, salamanders, certain bony fish, and even sharks have a third on the developed eye that arises from the pineal gland. So the contrapart of this complex is not only the heart, but the heart and the thymus gland. In the case of the heart, each ventricle would be a contrapart of an eye. And if we look at a cross-section of the heart and a cross-section of an eye, we'll find striking similarities. Inside the heart, we find some structures called the papillary muscles and the cordia tendinii. The function of these structures is to pull open the heart valves. Likewise, inside the eyes, we find very similar structures called the ciliary muscle and the thoracic fibers. And the function of these structures is to pull the lens to focus the eye. On the other hand, the pineal gland is also associated with the circadian rhythm or dream cycle, which I believe is a contrapart for the systoles and diastoles of the heart. The circadian rhythm and the heartbeat modulate the two largest electric fields generated by the body. The heartbeat modulates electric field around the heart and the circadian rhythm modulates electric field around the head. 
But what if these fields are not the product of these organs? What if the organs are the products of these fields? It has been found that the process of mitosis involves charge. This is not well understood yet, but it has been observed that microtubules are charged when they assemble to connect to the kinetochores. This knowledge has enabled the development of cancer therapies that uses external electric fields to inhibit cell division. I believe the heart, the thymus gland, and the ocular pineal complex could be present as electromagnetic polarities even at the pre-embryonic stage, leading, through their fluctuating cycles, the development of the embryo. I also believe that the cell is a fractal version of the body, and the body a fractal version of the Earth. This is all very interesting, but is there any evidence of functional connections between the heart and the eyes? It has been found that people with sleep deprivation are at a much higher risk of heart disease than people who sleep normally. This by itself doesn't prove much. What is truly significant is that heart disease can be spotted way ahead of time by looking for symptoms in the eyes. A study conducted at the American University of Beirut by Dr. A.M. Mansour has shown a clear correlation between congenital heart disease and ocular pathology. And this serendipity is something that should be taken into serious consideration. So, if you have ever heard that phrase that says, it is only with the heart that one can see rightly, now you know why. Right below the lungs we have the liver. The contrapart of the liver is not too hard to identify, and I believe it is the pituitary gland. The physical resemblance between these two structures is remarkable and they both serve endocrine functions and work as a team. Furthermore, it has been found that malfunction of the pituitary gland can lead to diseases like non-alcoholic fatty liver. Now, the gallbladder is a structure below the liver. Because of the position and the physical resemblance, I believe the contrapart of the gallbladder is no other than the nervous chiasma. Next to the liver, we have the stomach. From this point downward, and for reasons I don't yet understand, we're gonna have two instead of one contrapart for every organ in the digestive tract. I believe the jalk sac could be accountable for the missing contraparts, but I'm not too certain of this conjecture. Based on the shape and position, I have come to suspect that the contrapart of the stomach is a structure called the putamen. Next to the stomach, we have the pancreas. The pancreas is part of the endocrine system. Based on the shape, position, and function of this gland, I have come to believe that its contrapart is a structure we know as the hypothalamus. Following the stomach, we have the small intestine. And if we follow the putamen through the caudate nucleus, we'll find a structure called the hippocampus. For this reason, I believe the hippocampus could be a contrapart of the small intestine. After the small intestine, we have the colon. And I believe the contrapart of the colon is probably the most famous part of the brain. It is a part called the cerebrum. A study published at PLOS One by Qian Hua Chen, Cheng Li Ling, and Xia Hong Kao has shown a correlation between irritable bowel syndrome and dementia. A study published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology has shown a correlation between the decline of cognitive function and colorectal cancer, and the condition known as autism has also been associated with problems in the digestive tract. It is also important to remember the intrinsic connection between the brain and the digestive tract. We have over 100 million neurons on the gut, and some scientists have referred to them as a second brain. For years, we have tried to understand cognitive function by studying the brain. But from the perspective of the mirror model, this is like trying to understand a soccer game by looking at half of the arena. I believe the process of thinking works somehow similar to the process of playing a guitar. To make music with a guitar, the player not only manipulates one side of the instrument. To play a guitar, the musician has to form chords with one hand while strumming the strings with the other hand. I believe something very similar happens during the process of thinking. I don't think thinking is about the way neurons are fired in the brain. I believe it is about the coordination of the neurons in the digestive tract and the neurons in the brain. And if we are able to understand the grammar of this relation, we may be able to understand how thinking works. The kidneys, like the heart, are one of these special organs that develop from the mesoderm. For this reason, it is logical to conclude that the contrapart of the kidneys also have a mesodermal origin. If the contrapart of the heart are the eyes, it would make a lot of sense if the contrapart of the kidneys are also sensorial organs. For this reason, I believe the contrapart of the kidneys are the ears. If we look at cross-sections of the kidney and cross-sections of the cochlea, we can certainly see some resemblance. But there's more. 
There is a syndrome called branchiotorenal syndrome, or BOR. This syndrome is characterized for ill formation of the ears and the kidneys. Like the kidneys and the heart, the reproductive organs also have a mesodermal origin. If we follow this sensorial pattern, it is logical to conclude that the counterpart of the reproductive organs is no other than the olfactory system. Like the female reproductive organ, the nose is a highly humectated cavity. Now, there is two places in the body with a significant amount of erectile tissue. One is the penis or the clitoris, and the other one, believe it or not, is the nose. It is also very important to remember the relevance of the sense of smell on the reproductive process. But there is more. There is a genetic condition called Kalman syndrome. People with this condition are unable to complete puberty and have highly underdeveloped reproductive organs. But the important part is that these people have very little or no sense of smell. And I believe this fact should raise a flag. But there's even more. A genetic experiment conducted at Harvard University by Dr. Catherine Dulac also demonstrated a correlation between sexual behavior and the nose. This experiment is significant because it suggests that genetic modification could be used to test the validity of other LH mirror structures. If we engineer variations of mutations like antinapidia, TSN, or BOR, and we extrapolate these mutations onto other parts of the genome, we should expect variations on parts of a phenotype predicted by this model. Another important observation we should do to test the validity of this model is to monitor the electric distribution of a fertilized egg through the process of development. If the circadian and cardiac rhythms are indeed electromagnetic cycles that guide the development of the embryo, these polarities should be observable in this experiment. The other experiment I'm going to propose relates to the electric relation between the brain and the digestive tract. The brain is divided into functional regions known as Brodmann areas. I believe that if we observe the whole body performing discrete functions associated with the specific Brodmann areas, we'll be able to find counterparts to these Brodmann areas in the digestive tract. Now, on this video, I have presented a very radical hypothesis and I have covered a lot of material to support this view. So, let's briefly summarize what the mirror model is all about. The mirror model postulates that the head and the body are two expressions of the same principle, that the ectoderm and the endoderm are following the same structures but in opposite directions, and the mesoderm is also following this mirror effect but within itself. To support this view, I have looked for syndromes, symptoms, and functions that reflect this mirror effect, and I have found quite a few. Tooth and nail syndrome fits the model. The antennapedia mutation in fruit flies really fits the model. The role played by deep nuclei within the cerebellum on respiration fits the model. The reflection of heart disease on the eyes really fits the model. The reflection of pituitary malfunction on the liver fits the model. The correlation between dementia and irritable bowels fits the model. The affliction of both the ears and the kidneys by branchiotorenal syndrome very much fits the model. The presence of erectile tissue in the nose fits the model. And the afflictions of the olfactory and reproductive systems by Kalman syndrome also fits the model. You may say this is just circumstantial or smoking gun evidence, but this gun seems to have a lot of smoke. These coincidences are not trivial. They're highly significant and there are quite a few. Now, I don't have the means to read and compare genetic sequences, but you may. That's why I'm reaching out for your help. If this proposition is correct, we should be able to get a lot more evidence by comparing the sequences of parallel structures. I have shown this material to many scientists. Some have been very receptive, some have been cautious, but some seem to be very annoyed by it. Statements like, you're quoting nobody, this is too simple, or you should study more, are statements that are not arguments. And so far, I haven't received one single argument proving this model wrong. Science is not written in stone. It evolves according to observations. Yes, this model is very simple. And so is the fact that the moon is falling around the Earth and the planets around the sun. And that Lewis' model of segmentation and the decision Einstein had to take to get rid of absolute time without quoting anyone. All I can do is invite you to look through the telescope and show you this Rosetta stone. It's up to you to look or not. But I believe the possibilities that can unfold from this idea are worth a shot. You can learn more about the mirror model and read articles confirming some of these claims at mirrormodel.wordpress.com. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.